It's an odd thing, really, the form of radioactivity given the name beta. Rutherford was the first to observe it, and at the turn of the 20th century, it was shown that it involved an electron and came from the nucleus. Until the discovery of the neutron, it led physicists and chemists to believe that there were electrons in the nucleus, closely bound up with some of the protons there. But even then, it was a mystery. Why did the proton-electron players split up in some cases and not in others? How did the electron stay in such a small space when that would have violated Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? And why, if the nucleus had energy levels, did the electron get emitted with a full range of energies rather than at discrete energy values as light did when electrons moving around the nucleus emitted that form of radiation? Pauli suggested the solution to the last question when he hypothesized that the third particle was involved in beta decay, the previously mentioned neutrino. When the neutron was discovered by Chadwick and recognized as the other component of the nucleus, it solved the problem of electrons violating uncertainty, but it introduced another question. Why were neutrons able to decay when they seemed to be so much like protons? Why were they always unstable when found outside the nucleus, and sometimes unstable even when inside? When Fermi formulated a field theory-based interaction that explained this for us, something that acted only on the scale of the size of a subatomic particle, it seemed to be progress towards a solution. But like all the field theories of the 1930s, it was rife with infinities. When renormalization was introduced in 1947, it was determined that Fermi's interaction didn't meet the criteria. Renormalization couldn't absorb all the infinite quantities into the observable characteristics of the system. And even if that was ignored, the path integral approaches didn't converge. Moreover, there was a lack of an intermediate vector boson that could be exchanged to account for the force. Electrodynamics had the photon, and the nuclear force had the pi meson, but there seemed to be fundamental differences to how the interaction behaved. So intractable did these problems seem that they led many particle physicists to believe that field theory was a dead end that offered no hope for finding a description of the subatomic world that would account for these phenomena. However, as the conservative 50s turned into the turbulent 60s, there began to be glimpses of a world unseen in the data that was accumulating in the particle accelerators of the world. In places like Stony Brook, Brookhaven, and CERN, and at Stanford and Fermilab, hints began to appear of a level of structure unknown and unguessed by the likes of Pauli, Heisenberg, and Dirac. It was from this data that the true picture of the strong interaction would emerge from the mind of Gelman, and also in that data was an answer to the riddle of the beta and so much more. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom, Episode 24, Through the Looking Glass, Darkly. As has often been the case with this podcast, it is sometimes useful for us to go backwards in order to go forward. While we've almost made it to the present day several times in our most recent episodes, we have found each time that we've been missing pieces of the puzzle, things unexplained or unresolved. Yet we know that in today's world of particle physics, there is a description of matter and how it interacts that is one of the two most successful scientific theories ever devised the thing physicists refer to as the standard model. So how did we get to this point? We've talked about the development of a truly quantum field theory from electromagnetism called quantum electrodynamics that explains how charged particles in space, things like electrons, interact via the electromagnetic interaction. In the last episode, we got inside the nucleus to describe how certain types of subatomic particles are built out of even smaller things called quarks that interact with each other 
via the strong interaction. While we still have some of that story to tell, we need to go back and look at one other thing because it will help us finish the picture of what is happening inside of particles on the most fundamental level. This episode is the narrative of that other thing. One of the most perplexing things in particle physics is why almost all baryons, those higher mass particles, and all mesons, those medium mass particles, are unstable. With the rather important exception of the proton, everything else decays into something different, even the neutron. In fact, it was the neutron that was the first elementary particle that was observed to be unstable, and it is there where we will begin our explanation and exploration of the most important and exotic of islands, if I may be excused for dipping into our odyssey metaphor a bit here. Beta decay was one of the first three forms of radioactivity observed when that phenomenon was first discovered at the end of the 19th century. Shown to be the emission of electrons from the innermost part of the atom, something later shown by Rutherford to be the nucleus, it was not like alpha and gamma radiation. In those processes, the emitted radiation had what was called a discrete spectrum, with particles emitted only at very certain specific energies. In 1914, just prior to being trapped behind enemy lines and confined to a German enemy alien camp, James Chadwick, who would later discover the neutron, was able to show that the emitted electrons could emerge from the nucleus of an atom with a whole different range of energies. In other words, the spectrum of energies was not discrete. And this was a huge mystery, something that really, really perplexed the world. And it became such an issue that in 1930, in what was probably his most impulsive piece of work, Wolfgang Pauli suggested, almost out of desperation, that perhaps this discrepancy, something not allowed by the physics of quantum mechanics, could be explained if there was another unseen particle involved. In a letter to the Proceedings of a Conference on Nuclear Physics being held in Tübingen in December of that year, Pauli suggested that a second particle might be emitted from the nucleus that did not interact strongly with the surrounding matter and thus would be difficult to detect. This particle would carry off some of the energy that would have normally been given to the electron. Thus, it could solve this energy problem. He initially called this particle a neutron as they hypothesized that it would carry no charge. In other words, it would be neutral. In 1931, Pauli attended a conference in Rome where he communicated this idea to Enrico Fermi, who, to quote Pauli, quote, at once showed a lively interest in my idea and a very positive attitude towards my new neutral particles, unquote. When, in 1932, the name neutron was given to the new particle discovered by Chadwick, Pauli's particle was renamed by Fermi to be the neutrino, which really means little neutral particle. To again quote Pauli, this time from an address to the 1933 Solvay conference, he says, quote, as for the properties of these neutral particles, the atomic weights of the radioactive elements in particular teach us that their mass cannot exceed the mass of an electron by a lot. To distinguish them from the heavy neutrons, Mr. Fermi has suggested the name neutrino. It is possible that the rest mass of neutrinos equals zero so that they will have to propagate like the photons with the speed of light. In any case, their penetrating power exceeds many times that of photons of the same energy. It seems to me admissible they obey Fermi's statistics, even though experience does not provide us with any direct proof of this hypothesis." Unquote. In all of those things near the end, Pauli would be more or less correct. These particles, these neutrinos, would have very little mass, probably very close to zero, and they would not interact with normal matter, thus allowing them to penetrate through all kinds of shielding. Now from this conference, Fermi would take home a number of ideas that would lead to a new description of beta decay that would form the foundation of everything to come. Working from the mathematical model put forward by Dirac to describe the interaction of an electron and a photon, Fermi developed a description of an interaction that would transform a neutron into a proton while emitting both an electron and a neutrino. In this model, it was thought that the neutrino would play the same role in the interaction as the photon did in the electromagnetic case. 
two important characteristics of this new model were one, the charge of the electron, that most fundamental of physical properties in the electromagnetic interaction, was replaced with a new coupling constant, something now called the Fermi coupling constant. And two, the interaction was described not as something that happened when the two particles were separated by some distance, but rather only when the particles were in contact. By 1934, after some difficulty getting the more conservative journals in physics to publish his work, Fermi was finally able to get a fuller and more general theory into the hands of the scientific community by publishing in a German journal that was looking for quality work to publish after the expulsion of so many Jewish theorists and their subsequent refusal to publish in instruments originating from that country. In 1936, George Gamow and Edward Teller were able to generalize the interaction even further to better explain a number of other types of interactions, most notably in processes related to how stars fuse lighter elements in their cores to produce heavier elements, something that we now call nucleosynthesis. While these generalizations to Fermi's model were an indication that the core ideas there had validity, there were still significant problems with his description of the process. As was the case with Dirac's QED, the mathematical model of the Fermi interaction suffered from the problem of producing a number of calculational infinities for properties that were observed to be finite. All of this, of course, would be shelved in the years between 1939 and 1946 as Fermi and others turned to more pressing concerns as we previously discussed. With the development of renormalization theory, it was found that Fermi's interaction failed the requirements of that approach and thus was demoted to somewhat of a second-rate idea. The problem was that no one knew of another way to think of how to account for the fundamental process of beta decay without following the same approach as Fermi had. As was the case with the development of renormalization theory, it would take a discovery of something not right about what the theory predicted to open the way for new insights. At this point, it is useful to take a bit of a digression to talk about something of fundamental significance in physics, something we call conservation laws. When I teach my introductory physics courses, one of the things I spend a lot of time on, right after I talk about the basics of how and why objects move, is what we call conservation laws. These particular ones that I talk about are known as conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. In chemistry, it was Lavoisier who introduced the idea of conservation of mass, something that was later subsumed into the conservation of energy principle with Einstein's special theory of relativity. We've talked about these ideas a bit in previous podcast episodes, so I won't belabor them here, other than to say that when we physicists find a quantity that must be conserved by all systems, it's a really big deal. It's such a big deal, in fact, that the distinguished mathematician Emmy Noether, who has been described by many as the most important woman in the history of mathematics, put forward a theorem that any time a conservation law is found, it describes what is known as a symmetry inherent in the universe. Wow, that's really out there, isn't it? That that thing to say, to say, quote, a symmetry inherent in the universe. Maybe I ought to unpack that just a little bit. When we look at a physical process that can happen, one of the things we wonder is if that process can or would happen the same way in any number of different circumstances. One way to test that might be to have the process take place in a lot of different ways and see if it happens the same way every time. Another way is to build a mathematical model of the process and then look to see if the math changes if we change the environment. One example of this might to see if a process happens the same way at all times or in all similar places, either through observation or in an examination of the mathematical description. The fancy name for this sort of thing is to say or to ask whether a system is invariant under transformation.
What Noether suggested is that if a group of processes showed invariance under transformation, what we now call symmetry, this meant there had to be a conservation law associated with that invariance and vice versa. If we found a conservation law, that meant there had to be a fundamental symmetry inherent in the universe. So if a system behaves the same at different positions, that means it conserves momentum, meaning that this quantity of a system can't be created or destroyed, only transferred between parts of the system. If the system behaves the same way at different times, that means that energy is conserved. If it behaves the same way when rotated around some axis, that means a property we call angular momentum is conserved. The most intriguing of these symmetry conservation law pairs, at least for our discussion in this episode, turns out to be something known as mirror symmetry or reflection symmetry. And it, the name for the conservation law is what's called parity conservation. So what does that mean? Actually, it's sort of a tough thing to describe, but a simplified way of thinking about this goes as follows. If you stand in front of a mirror and do something, your reflection in the mirror does the same thing. If you raise your right hand, the image in the mirror raises the hand on the same side. In fact, if you were looking at that system that showed that kind of symmetry that underwent its behavior in front of a mirror, you wouldn't be able to tell which was the real system and which was the reflection just from your observations. Both would act in exactly the same way. If this symmetry was broken, then the image would act in some different way, as would might be the case if when you raised your right hand in front of the mirror, the image raised the hand on the opposite side of its body. That would be an example of symmetry breaking in parity. Now it's always been sort of assumed that everything in the universe has parity symmetry, that it is symmetric across reflection. We certainly know that gravitational interactions and electromagnetic ones do because we can both observe them and the mathematics, when transformed by reflection, comes out exactly the same. This has first been shown to be true for atomic states by Otto Laporte in 1925, and then for the entire electromagnetic interaction by Eugene Figner in 1927. In fact, it was this work that would earn Figner his 1936 Nobel Prize in Physics. So these interactions are said to be what we call parity conserving. In the 1950s, it was assumed that the nuclear and Fermi interactions did the same thing. As the number of different types of subatomic particles being observed and produced in various experiments began to multiply, physicists began to realize that it was a very useful thing to keep track of the parity of each type of particle as it would allow them to better understand the various decay processes that transform one type of particle into one or more others. In doing this, however, a puzzle was discovered, something that was eventually called the theta tau puzzle. The tau particle was something that decayed into a combination of three pions, two with positive isospin, that thing that we talked about in an earlier podcast, and one with negative isospin while the theta particle decayed into a positive-negative isospin pion pair. Now before I go on, I know that this is a whole lot of different kind of weird particles and all of that. Just keep in mind that there are two sort of different processes going on here. Now when the parities of the decay products of the two processes are calculated, they turn out to be different values, which should, wouldn't seem to be all that surprising, except that the original tau and theta particles turned out to have exactly the same mass and exactly the same lifetimes, at least within experimental error. Now normally, if it weren't for the parity thing, if a particle physicist saw two particles with the same mass and lifetime in an experiment, they would actually assume that they were the same single particle, and that that particle might have two different ways of decaying. That happens all the time. However, since the different decay sets had different parities, and it was thought that the parent particle had to have the same parity as the decay products due to parity conservation, this implied that either the particles were different or that maybe, possibly, the parity wasn't conserved in that particular transformation. What's important to note is that both these particle transformations were part of the generalized class of things explained using the Fermi interaction. An attempt to resolve this puzzle was made in 1956 by the Chinese-American physicists T.D. Li and C.N. Yang. 
at a conference on high energy nuclear physics held in Rochester, New York. Their suggested solution was that certain types of particles, those with the strangely long lifetimes we discussed in the last episode, always had to come in pairs which would be identical except that they would have different parities, one being even parity and one being odd parity. Now in the audience for the talk were Martin Bloch, an experimental physicist, and Richard Feynman, the famous theorist. The two happened to be sharing a hotel room and after the day's proceedings were finished and the two were relaxing and sort of going over what they had heard that day, Bloch asked Feynman why parity conservation was such a big deal. Did parity really have to be conserved, or was that just something everyone assumed? As Fairman thought about it, he realized that while parity conservation had been shown in gravitation and electromagnetism, it wasn't so clear that it had been shown for the other two kinds of interactions that were being discussed at the time. So, in the following day's discussion at the conference, Feynman raised the question of whether the tau and the theta were actually the same particle with different parity states to Li and Yang. The two admitted that while they had considered the possibility, they hadn't arrived at any firm conclusions, and that such a parity violation was certainly possible. Moreover, they said, if this did occur, the parity violation might be able to explain a lot of the characteristics of the Fermi interaction. Now, Li was known to have this saying, they would express to his students. It had two points to it. The first point said, without experimentalists, theorists tend to drift. The second point said, without theorists, experimentalists tend to falter. As the theory seemed to be drifting in this case, Li and Yang went back into the published literature to look at the data produced by the experimentalists related to parity in processes involving both the nuclear and Fermi interactions. While they found strong evidence for parity conversation with respect to the nuclear interaction, they came up empty when examining processes mediated by the Fermi interaction. By looking at the various types of quantities that could be tested, they were able to suggest several very specific experiments to see if parity was conserved for these types of processes. One of these experiments involved examining the beta decay process of a specific isotope of cobalt. By examining the way the electron in the decay was emitted compared to the spin quantum number of the cobalt atom's nucleus, a test could be developed to determine if the process would be symmetric with its mirror image. The difficulty with this test was that to make the observation, it had to be carried out at extremely low temperatures. Fortunately, one of Li and Yang's colleagues at Columbia was the brilliant experimentalist Xin Sheng Yu, an expert in examining beta decay. Working with the cryogenic facility at the National Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C., Wu was able to build an apparatus that would make the measurements, and on December 26th of 1956, Wu's group was able to get excellent results that confirmed that the process did, indeed, violate parity conservation. She communicated her results back to Lee at Columbia, asking him not to share them there as she was still doing some final double checking of the work. Lee, however, related the information in a Friday seminar for the physics department. Three of the listeners, Richard Garwin, Leon Linderman, and R. Reinrich, then modified an existing cyclotron experiment and confirmed Wu's results. The two groups published their papers simultaneously, with primary credit of the experimental discovery going to Wu. From this discovery, Li and Yang were able to reconsider Fermi's original theory along with the various other generalizations that had been made to it. In doing this, they rewrote Fermi's description of the interaction between the various types of particles that participated, taking into account the fact that parity is not conserved, and thus particles can said to be have a sort of handedness or preference for which type of parity they have. Extended through a suggestion made by Feynman to include the interaction with electrons and muons, this new theory, now known as VA theory, represented a significant advance to Fermi's interaction.
It allowed experimental particle physicists to better predict the types of particle interactions that would take place and what the products of those interactions might be. This would become an important tool that would serve researchers well as the new and significantly more powerful particle accelerators came online in the mid-1950s. It would be these data that would provide the results that would go into Gelman's Eightfold Way. There was one other important outcome of the experimental work and the VA theory it led to. The same experiments that showed that parity was not conserved also indicated that another symmetry was broken by this new interaction, and this one only. Called charge conjugation symmetry, this says that antimatters have to obey all the same rules of the universe in the same way that regular matter particles do. The data showed that antimatter particles are transformed differently by this interaction than the regular old stuff we're all made of. While this seems like another mystery, it actually solves a problem of some real importance. Prior to this discovery, all of the theoretical work being done suggested that antimatter particles should be created in various processes, including those that were prevalent in the early universe, at the exact same rate as matter particles. Now, if that was the case, where were all the antimatter things? Shouldn't there be antimatter stars and planets and galaxies and all the rest, you know, antimatter critters and bacteria and rocks and all that sort of thing? Well, it turns out that due to the broken C and P symmetries, as they were called, something that happens in about 1 in 100 million events, there is a slight preference towards creating matter over antimatter. While there is still a lot unknown about why this interaction seems to prefer matter ever so slightly over antimatter, we should all be thankful that it does, as that's the reason we're all here. Unfortunately, the steer theory still possessed infinities and was non-renormalizable, thus indicating there was still a ways to go in understanding the interaction. This led to two crises in understanding what was happening. The first had to do with the infinities. The VA theory worked phenomenally well at lower energy interactions, but the equations sort of exploded when working with high energy situations. This indicated there was some physics in the, that the equations weren't actually taken into account. In analogy with playing a game, the physicists knew how the rules worked for one part of the game, but they didn't know them for another. It's sort of like the addition of a sudden death overtime rule found in many sports where the first team or person to score in overtime wins the game. All of the other rules from the regular phase of the game stay the same, but in this new regime there's something that's added or changed that affects not only the outcome but how the game gets played. The second crisis was that a particle reaction that the theory predicted to happen didn't actually ever seem to happen. Now, Murray Gelman is quoted to have once said, quote, anything that isn't forbidden is compulsory. This is sometimes called the totalitarian rule of physics. The idea is that if a process could possibly take place, i.e. it's not forbidden by some law of nature, then sooner or later it will if the conditions are right for it to do so. The reaction in question was the decay of a muon into an electron and a photon. The theory said that such a thing was a possibility, but never in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of looking for it in accelerator data was the mu e gamma decay ever found. The second crisis, however, was solved by a team of experimentalists at Columbia led by the aforementioned Leon Lederman. Lederman's group was able to pioneer a new technique founded on the idea of creating a neutrino beam and then directing those neutrinos to collide with nuclei of some type of atom, in this case aluminum, to create either muons or electrons. From this, the decay of the muon could be more closely studied. What they found was that when the muon decayed, it produced a whole new kind of particle. 
From the theory, the way the decay should have gone was that the muon should have decayed into an electron and a neutrino-antineutrino pair. This pair would then annihilate each other, creating this high-energy photon. What Liederman's group found was that the muon decayed into an electron and then a neutrino and another kind of neutrino that had been no unknown up to that point. This resolved the mixing reaction crisis and also began to suggest that there might be families of these very small leptons, each associated with its own neutrino. So what do these two crises mean? They mean that the whole picture wasn't understood yet. There were still pieces of the puzzle to be found and fitted in. There was still physics to be discovered. In our last episode, we discussed the other research being done to find the puzzle pieces related to the interaction that held the nucleus together and the discovery of the quark leading to the strong interaction. This quark model would prove to be fundamentally important to better understanding this other interaction that we're talking about now, while in turn being informed by it. The result of that interaction between these two models of how things worked inside the nucleus would result in a synthesis of a model that would achieve the dream of Democritus and Boscovich. And that'll be the subject of our next episode. As I close this episode, let me acknowledge some of my sources. First, Leon Lederman's fine book on his journey through particle physics named The God Particle. If I could recommend one book to get someone through this last bit of material, it would be this one. Lederman's work is light, funny, and informative. Also, I found Alexander Lysoff's senior honors thesis from the University of South Carolina to be particularly helpful in understanding both the details of the Fermi interaction and the work of Li and Yang. And finally, thanks to everyone for hanging in with the podcast as the material gets tougher to absorb and more complex. While I know things can be pretty technical and jargony at times, I think this deep dive into the nature of matter and its interactions is profoundly fascinating, and I hope you agree. If you're enjoying the material, won't you leave us a strong review at iTunes or whatever service you use to listen to the podcast? It'll really help us get the word out to more folks. So until next time, full sails on your journey. <laughs>